Story one, my wife just admitted that she's an alcoholic and it doesn't stop there. I think I need to go to rehab. My heart dropped when I heard that. It came out of nowhere. The woman I was married to and living with had been struggling in the throes of addiction and I was none the wiser. I had never felt so taken aback. Carrie, what do you mean? I don't understand where this is coming from, I said, gingerly taking her hand in mine. Exactly what I said. I need help, John. I've been drinking again. Like a lot. My mouth involuntarily fell open. Carrie had admitted to having alcohol dependency after graduating from college, but I had always been under the impression that she'd nipped it in the bud. Honey, how long has this been going on? I never would have guessed if you hadn't told me, I replied, taking a step back. I know, she said, tears welling in her eyes. It's been six months. I've been drinking vodka to hide the smell. That nightly glass of wine, it's actually cranberry juice and Smirnoff. I've been throwing the empty bottles in the dumpster behind my work so you wouldn't catch on. I'm sorry that I kept this from you. I really am. I just couldn't bear the thought of losing you over it. Carrie broke down, tears streaking down her cheeks. Hey, hey, I would never leave you over something like that. You are the love of my life. We'll get through this together, I reassured her, gently rubbing her back. Really? That makes me so happy to hear. She wrapped her arms around me, and she stayed there for a long time, sobbing into my shirt. Thank you for being so accepting. I needed that, Carrie said, finally pulling away. That's what I'm here for. I'll support you no matter what, but there's something that I need to know. Anything for you. I need you to be honest with me. Is that all you're hiding? Her eyes widened, and I could see the wheels turning in her head. No, this was it. There's nothing else going on. Carrie, don't lie to me. We've been married for 13 years. I know when you're not telling the truth. Fine. I've been going to a support group. You know, for alcoholics. My brows furrowed. Okay. And why did you feel the need to keep that from me? Because it's not working. This was a lot to get off my chest. I don't want to talk about it anymore. All right. But we're going to revisit this later. She nodded before darting into our room and locking the door. I didn't know what she was playing at, but I knew that my wife wasn't telling the truth. Not all of it, at least. And I was determined to find out what she was hiding. Now I wish I would have just left her alone. Carrie didn't check herself into rehab right away. She said that she had to make some preparations before being admitted. No problem there. What was an issue was the late nights that she would spend out with people she claimed to be friends or co-workers, or family. I knew better. Each time Carrie would tell me that she was coming home late, I'd check her location. She's not the best with technology, so I'd wager a guess that she forgot that she shared it with me. And I used that to my advantage. Whenever my wife made up an excuse not to come home, her phone said that she was always at one spot, the abandoned church on the outskirts of town. So I did what any suspicious husband would do. I tried to catch her in the act. Look, man, I don't know if this is the best idea, my co-worker, Jeremy, said as I neared the parking lot. Oh, yeah. Well, what would you do in this situation? I'd probably just, like, call the cops or something. Really? And tell them what? That my wife might be boinking some random dude in an empty church? They'd be more likely to write me a ticket for filing a false report. Whatever, man, I tried to warn you. Good luck. And with that, the line went dead. Thanks, I guess, I grumbled, slapping the car in park and pocketing my phone. I glanced up at the rundown building before me, stealing myself for what I was about to do. The church was even creepier in person. A fire had left it completely charred, evidenced by the imprints left around the shattered windows. Vines snaked along the exterior, lending to the place's eerie ambience. I really didn't want to have to go in there, but I knew that I didn't have any other choice. After reassuring myself in the rearview mirror for what must have been at least ten minutes, I finally gathered the courage to go inside. I crept up to the entrance, my eyes darting frantically around the parking lot. I felt like I was doing something wrong, like one misteps would have the local police force swarming me in an instant. I quietly pushed open the front door, breathing a sigh of relief when it didn't creak. The church was dark, but I could see a faint light emitting from one of the rooms toward the back. My heart jackhammered in my chest. Was I really doing this? 
What if Carrie found out? It would break her. Number, she wasn't being honest with me, and I had to know why. I couldn't afford to turn and run, not after making it so far. I pressed forward, following a path that had been cleared through the debris. Aside from that, the interior looked just as I imagined it had the day of the fire. Everything had been burnt to a crisp, save for a marble statue of the Virgin Mary, near what used to be a stained glass window. I shuddered when I saw it. It felt as if its eyes were following me around the room, casting judgment on me. After a painstakingly long time trying to remain silent, I finally made it to the source of the light. I cautiously peeked my head around the corner to what I assumed was someone's hollowed-out office. What I saw still haunts me to this day. Carrie, along with about four other pale figures in hooded robes, were gathered around a man's flayed corpse. His organs had been carved out, and the group was chanting in an unintelligible language. Beneath the body lay what appeared to be a pentagram. I ducked out of view, clutching my chest and trying to stifle my breathing. This couldn't be happening. I began to question everything I knew about my wife. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. I did the only logical thing I could do at that moment. I hightailed it out of there. I crept out of the church as quickly as I could without alerting any of those lunatics, and I raced home, going well over the speed limit. Once I arrived back at the house, I tried my best to steady myself. Hot tears stung my eyes as I pulled out my phone. I didn't want to do it, but I knew that I had to. I steeled my resolve and I called the police on my wife. Hello, 911. What is your emergency? I th think I just saw a cult ritual. There was this guy and he was... I nearly vomited just recanting the gruesome scene, but I managed to keep it down. The man, he was... dead. Please, you have to send someone. It was at the old church on Fifth Avenue. All right, sir, stay calm. I'm sending a squad car. Are you in the vicinity? What? N no, I'm safe. I... My eyes grew wide and for a moment, I thought that I might pass out. Just then, I received a text from Carrie. My breathing shallowed as I opened it. There was a picture. One of my cars sitting in the church parking lot. It was followed by a close-up of me in the driver's seat. My heart thumped wildly in my chest as a text bubble appeared. We need to talk. If you tell anyone about this, you'll be next. Hello? Sir, are you still on the line? The operator asked, pulling me out of it. What did the man look like? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, but I have to go. I hung up before she had a chance to protest. I didn't waste any time. I packed what I could in the few precious minutes that I had and I left. I have a feeling that I just messed with some very powerful people. I'm going to get as far away from that town as possible, no matter the cost. I'm not sure what's next for me. All I know is that I don't want to end up like that man with his chest open for all to see, lying on the floor of an abandoned church. Story two, I was pretty sure my wife was cheating on me, but reality was so much worse. My suspicions of infidelity first started when Steph was spending way too much time on her phone. She's never been very tech dependent, so it was odd when her phone glued itself to her palm. She would smile whenever her phone vibrated, giggle after reading her new message, and text back excitedly all while the look of love marked her face. I recognized that look all too well. It was the look she'd had for me all those years ago when we first started dating. While I was sure of my wife's infidelity, I needed to validate my suspicions. I snuck up behind her and watched as her fingers danced across the keypad. But when the chat log came into view, my heart dropped. Her phone buzzed and an image pixelated on the screen. I fully expected a nude or something, but it was a photo of a man. Only the man was not whole. He was severed into many different pieces. His limbs decorated a hard concrete floor, his head pressed up against the ground, and his torso slit wide open exposing a hollow chest cavity. I almost swore under my breath but remained composed. Steph giggled at the image and began crafting a reply. Cute. I love how you left the eyes in the head this time. She clicked the send button, biting her thumb in anticipation of a reply. Three sequentially blinking dots appeared on the bottom of the screen. The message lit up her phone. I was saving them for you. The reply read flirtatiously. Steph repositioned herself in giddy excitement 
and hurriedly crafted a reply. You mean it. When can I come down? She wrote in joyously. My heart must have been banging against my chest at this point because Steph swiveled her head in my direction, pressing the phone to her person. What are you doing? She said in angry annoyance. I had so many questions festering on the end of my tongue, but my mind sputtered still trying to come to terms with my wife's horrific messages. I just stood there frozen like some shock-stricken fool. Steph, however, filled the empty air with a violent reprimand. How dare you violate my personal space? You're an inconsiderate asshole. I can't believe you, she spat out in fury. Her open palms smacked across my cheek, snapping me out of my bewilderment. When my eyes refocused on Steph, I saw a bloodthirsty rage stewing behind her pupils. I tried to say something, anything, but what can you say when your wife is texting with Jeffrey Dummer? Fuck you, Ryan, she hissed and retreated into our bedroom, slamming the door behind her. I slumped down on the couch, contemplating what I'd just seen. Steph's never been a violent person, but here I was clutching my cheek while she was laughing at a murder scene on her phone. Night had fallen and Steph never came out of the bedroom. That whole time I weighed my options. Should I call the police? Should I pack my shit and leave? Do I gather more evidence and get her admitted into some psych ward? The choice may seem easy from the outside looking in, but it wasn't easy for me. I wanted to give Steph the benefit of the doubt, but to do that, I needed to know the truth. I slowly creaked the bedroom door open and saw a figure sleeping soundly under the covers. On the nightstand rested Steph's phone. I cautiously entered the room, doing my best not to wake my sleeping wife. Luckily, Steph's always been a heavy sleeper. When the phone lit up the dark room, Steph stirred but quickly regained her restful slumber. I immediately opened her messages and almost dropped the phone. The gory messages were sent under the name Horror. Never in my life had an emoji filled me with so much dread. I needed to know who this monster was, so I texted from Steph's phone, hoping to get a reply. Who is this? My message said. I clicked the send button, gripping the phone with a newfound determination. I know, I know. Not a very inventive message to send when trying to get information out of your wife's lover, but what can I say I was in a delusional state? Anyone would be if they found themselves in such a situation. Not a second later, the phone buzzed. Who is this? The new message read. The person on the other line seemed to be mocking me, but that thought was swallowed when I noticed the number directly under the demon emoji. The messages were coming directly from Steph's phone. She was messaging herself. I replayed the memory from earlier in the day and vividly remembered the three sequentially blinking dots at the bottom of the screen as someone else crafted a message from the other end. Steph's fingers, however, remained still. This doesn't make any sense. I thought to myself, but my blood ran cold as the three dots once again danced at the bottom of the chat log. The phone buzzed and a sentence appeared on the screen. Are you scared? What the hell? I said as a cold chill ran down my spine. Suddenly, the figure under the covers began flailing wildly. The quick movement startled me so much that it made me drop the phone, and the device tumbled under the bed. Steph! I called out apprehensively at the figure under the sheets, but there was no response, only more frantic thrashing. Honey, are you okay? I said with a quivering lip. I grasped the edge of the blanket and yanked it off my wife, but when the figure came into view, Steph was nowhere to be found but a familiar face did greet me with a smile. It was the fragmented man from the gory images on Steph's phone. The severed limbs moved around disgustingly, the torso was just as empty, and the head smiled from ear to ear, almost thankful for its sorry state. W -w what is this? The only words that came to my mind. Out of nowhere, a demonic cackle came from the underside of my bed. Witchy and demented, the laugh caused my skin to break out in goosebumps. I instantly took a step back, but a hand darted out from under the bed frame and grasped my ankle. In the dark, the hand looked gnarled, but I noticed a familiar wedding ring on one of the fingers. Steph's head crested from the darkness, and her eyes twisted upward in my direction. I told you to mind your own business, she said in a screechy, gritted tone. She bared her teeth, which were now filed down to a point. With her shark-like smile, she cut into the flesh on my leg. I winced in pain. Instinct took over, and I kicked her in the face. Steph retreated under the bed. Her witchy laugh regained its full voice. 
You shouldn't have done that, she said with a twisted tone. Steph, what's going on? I said desperate for answers. Steph didn't answer my question and only returned a statement that made my confusion grow. He's coming for you, she said in an icy monotone voice. Who's coming? Steph talked to me. I begged. He, I thought to myself. Suddenly the severed man on the bed re-entered my thoughts. I panned my gaze back over to the fragmented figure to find its head now on its side, looking directly at me. His eerie smile was just as wide, his limbs just as mangled. Despite his appearance, the man didn't seem like a threat. One of his severed arms began to lift itself off the bed, index finger extended, pointing to the bedroom door. My heart dropped to the pit of my stomach as the floorboards creaked in that direction. A tall, goat-like figure now stood in the doorway. Its legs were furry and hooved, its torso strangely human, and its hands monstrously clawed, but I knew its face. Its face matched the demon emoji on my wife's phone. Beast face, though the creature before me was less cartoony and more gut-wrenching. I started to hyperventilate and back away till my rear met the wall behind me. A grin inched across the creature's face. It was finding pleasure in my terror. Steph crawled out from under the bed, glancing at me. She twisted her head and made her way to the creature awaiting her arrival. There was a glimmer of lust in the beast's blackened eyes as Steph crawled over with animalistic dexterity. When she reached its legs, she wrapped herself around one of them, caressing it as if it were her saving grace. The creature returned his gaze to me and gave a chuckle that tipped off the octave scale. He reached two hands to my wife's face and pulled her up by the underside of her chin. Without breaking its connection with me, it parted my wife's lips with a slimy kiss. Its forked tongue worked its way down Steph's throat, and a lump was clearly visible from the outside of her neck as it probed deep into her chest cavity. As it came back out, the smacking of saliva filled the air, and tendrils of spit clung to Steph's face. With the same love-filled stare she'd been giving her phone, she gazed into the monster's eyes. You're such a tease. Steph giggled as she caressed the beast's cheek. Through a strange tongue and in a deep voice, the monster ignored Steph and spoke directly at me. Ego tecum agam postea. When the creature saw that I didn't understand, it turned to Steph, expecting her to translate. Steph rolled her eyes but relented. He says he'll be back for you. She gave me a dismissive glance and returned her eyes to the monster. The beast grinned and flung my wife over his shoulder. Steph giggled in excitement, and they both disappeared into the dark hallway. I was left there in shock, but as the shock began to melt away, I felt the overwhelming need to cry. Tears streamed down my face, but I was unsure what emotion I was feeling. Was it fear or sadness? I didn't know. I had almost forgotten about the severed man on my bed, but my attention quickly returned to him as his mangled body began seizing. I watched as the man's eyes rolled to the back of his head and foam spilled out of his mouth. As fast as it all started, the man was still. I cautiously approached, expecting the man to lunge as I neared. But as I looked at his face, the color had drained from his head. I was sure he wasn't coming back this time. Morning came and I was still in my bedroom, afraid to leave in fear of the beast coming for me. But eventually I gained the courage and searched the house. Everything seemed normal for the most part except for one thing. In all of our photos that decorated the house, Steph had disappeared. It was only me. I checked her closet and everything was missing. Her contact on my phone had even vanished. The more I searched, the more I realized Steph's existence had been wiped from reality. But the one thing I wished had disappeared still lay in my bed, the severed man. I thought about calling the police, but how was I supposed to explain a chopped up body in my bedroom? Was I supposed to blame it on my wife, who seemed to no longer exist? Would I tell them that a devilish monster was their true suspect? Number no one would believe me. I decided to wrap him up in a rug and bury him in the backyard. When he was planted in the soil, I placed a little tree on top of the grave, hoping it would dissuade anyone from digging there. As impossible as it seems, I tried to forget about the whole ordeal. I guess it was a trauma response, trying to deny that it all happened. But earlier this morning, I received a message from an unknown number that shoved the bad memories back into my throat. I'll be there soon, the message said. I'm on edge all the time now.
Every strange sound causes me to panic. I'm scared to check any message that comes into my phone. I've been hearing the clattering of hooved feet on my floorboards. It's toying with me. I know it. I need help. Uh, I'm scared shitless. What the hell do I do?